Right, hello. So today I'm going to be going through, this is the second AS level paper. So this one is uh, Pure Maths and Statistics. Um, again, this is the MEI sample papers they've given out ahead of this summer's exams. Alright, so first off, we've got a pretty bog standard integration. Probably the first thing you want to do here is make it so it's x squared plus, and then we're going to want to turn this into a nice power of x. So we can make that plus x to the minus 2 dx. And then it's a case of adding 1 to the power and dividing by the new power. So x squared is going to become x to the 3 over 3. x to the minus 2 is going to become x to the minus 1 over minus 1. And don't forget your plus c on the end as well. So we've got x cubed over 3. And then we can tidy this up a bit. We can bring the minus outside and we can make the x to the minus 1 into 1 over x. And we've got the plus c on the end. So you get a mark for each term essentially. So a mark for a third x cubed, a mark for minus 1 over x. Now this OE means or equivalent. So that means you could have just left it as minus x to the minus 1 if you wanted to. And you even get a mark for your plus c. Okay, question two, express 2 log base 3x plus log base 3a as a single logarithm. So here we're having to use log laws to try and pack things together. So the first thing I would do is use, we know that if we have log, say if we have a log b, that we can bring that a into the power and make it log b to the a. So with that first bit, the 2 log 3x, what we're going to do is change that into log base 3 of x squared plus log a. Now that it's in this form, we're able to use the log law, whereas if we've got two logs times together, sorry, added together, we can make it log of those two things multiplied together. So we're going to have log base 3 of x squared times by a, so we can call that ax squared. Okay, uh, part 2, given that 2 log base 3x plus log a equals 2, express x in terms of a. Right, so now we know this equals 2, and this means we've got to have x equals and then some stuff in terms of a. So let's see if we can kind of pick this apart to make x the subject. So uh, first off, we can, we've got to think, what do we do to undo a log? So remember the opposite of logging something is putting it to the power of whatever the base is. So in our case, the base is 3. So what we're going to be doing in this step is be putting both sides to the power of 3. So the left-hand side, when we put it to the power of 3, is going to cancel out this log, and we'll just be left with ax squared. And that's going to equal 3 squared, which is 9. And now we've just got to make x the subject. So we can say x squared is a sorry 9 over a. And then if we square root we've got x is plus or minus the square root of 9 over a. But just, we'll look at the mark scheme in a second, but looking at where x started, x is in the logarithm. So I think x can't be negative because we can't have a negative logarithm. So we can probably forget about that plus or minus and just if we've got the square root of 9 over a, we're all right. So let's see what we've got. Um, so first thing, just one mark for getting to that. Then you get one mark for doing that first bit where we put everything to the power of 3, and then a mark for making x the subject. Um, so we've got x equals plus or minus 3 over root a. So ours is equivalent to that because the square root of 9 is 3, the square root of a is root a. Um, and it does say disregard x equals minus 3 over root a as x cannot be negative. And it must be clear that a negative root has been considered and disregarded. So that means you can't just forget to put the plus or minus. You need to have the plus or minus there and then show that you've got rid of it. So that's quite important. Question 3. Show the area of the region bounded by the curve 3x to the minus 3 over 2. The lines x equals 1 and x equals 3. And the x-axis is this. So um, let's think what we're doing here. We're, if we draw... So I'm not even going to worry about what that curve looks like, just to show us kind of um, what the question's really asking us. We've got some curve, let's so say it looks like this. And we're trying to find the area bounded by the x-axis, the lines x equals 1, x equals 3. So we're looking for this area here. 
So hopefully you know that means we've got to integrate the function between 3 and 1, and our function is 3x to the minus 3 over 2. Okay, so just like question 1, first thing we're going to have to do is add 1 to the power of x. So minus 3 over 2 plus 1 is minus a half. And then divide by the new power, so divide by minus a half, and our limits are 3 and 1. Um, let's tidy that up a bit. So if we divide by minus half, that's the same as timesing by minus 2. So we'll have minus 6x to the minus a half between 3 and 1. And now it's just a case of substituting in 3 and substituting in 1. So we've got minus 6 times 3 to the minus a half minus minus 6 times 1 to the minus a half. Okay, so we've subbed in 3 and then we've taken away what we get when we sub in 1. So let's see if we can tidy this up. So we've got minus 6 over, so 3 to the minus a half means it's over the square root of 3. Minus, minus, so that's going to become a plus. 6 times 1 to the minus a half. Now, 1 to the power of anything is just 1, so that's just going to be 6. Okay, so we should probably rationalise this denominator. So we'll, if we times top and bottom by root 3, we'll have minus 6 root 3 over 3. 6 stays as it is. And then we can cancel down this 6 and 3 down to a 2. So we've just got minus 2 root 3 plus 6. And I'm hoping that's the answer. Yep, so they wanted 6 minus 2 root 3. So let's look at the mark scheme. So you've got 1 for basically setting up the integral you needed to do. 1 for correct integration. 1 for correct limits at some point. 1 for subbing in the limits. And then... You need a correct intermediate step using thirds, so that's this bit here. So you can't just jump straight to there, and then you need to arrive at the answer. Okay. Right, question four. There are four human blood groups. These are called O, A, B, and AB. Each person has one of these blood groups. The table shows the distributions in a large country. So two people are selected at random from this country. Find the probability at least one of them has blood group O. OK, so I think if we're looking for at least one, I think we should do one minus the probability that no one has blood group O is probably the easiest way. OK, so let's think, what's the probability that we pick two people and none of them are from blood group O? Well, there's a 0 0.49 chance they're from O, which means there should be a 0 0.51 chance that they're not from O. And because we're picking two people at random, we're going to be doing 0 0.51 times by 0 0.51. So that's two people in a row, assuming it's independent, um, that aren't in blood group O. And that gives us 0 0.399. Right, find the probability they, they have different blood groups. Okay. So that means there's different ways we could do this. We could think of all the different possibilities. An O, then an A, an O, then a B, an O, then an A, B, an A, then a B, etc. And all the different ways. But I think, again, the, the easiest way to approach this is to think about what's the complement, what's the opposite of this happening. So in this case, the opposite of them having different blood groups is them having the same blood groups. So in other words, we can work out the probability that there are either two O's, which we've already kind of looked at, uh, two A's, two B's, and two AB's. So it's going to be a bit more work. Um, but these are all mutually exclusive events, so we can work them out individually and add them together, and then we're going to have to take the whole thing away from one. So the probability of two O's is going to be 0 0.49 times by 0 0.49, so squared. Two A's is going to be 0 0.38 times by itself. Two B's will be 0 0.1 squared. And two AB's will be 0 0.03 squared. So if we work those all out, bear with me. That in total gives us... 0 0.3954 and we're going to have to do 1 minus that because we want the probability of um, 
them having different blood groups, we get 0 0.6046. OK. So here we've got 1 minus 0 0.5, 1 squared for 1 mark, and then a mark for that. Um, and then again, they've taken away all those probabilities. This would be the other way of doing it, of actually manually working out an A and a B, an A and an O, etc. Um, and so yeah, and then 0 0.6046 for the answer. Right, a triangular field has sides of length 100, 120, and 135 meters. Find the area of the field. So let's draw a kind of little sketch of what's going on. So let's say this is 100, this is 120, and this is 135. Now we're essentially here, we're trying to find the area of a non-right angled triangle. So we we can't use base, half base times height because we don't know the height, but what we can do is eventually use half a b sine c. Now to do that we need to know two sides and the angle between the two sides. So what I think we're going to have to do is find one of these angles, I'm just going to at random pick this one, we could have picked any, and use the cosine rule to find that angle. Okay, so um, our cosine rule is, so cos a equals b squared plus c squared minus a squared over 2bc. So I'm using the one with the angle as the subject because I'm trying to find an angle. Um, you could use the one of the side as the subject and rearrange it if you prefer. So we've got cos x equals, now b and c are going to be the sides that aren't opposite x in this case. So we're going to have 100 squared plus 120 squared minus 135 squared all over 2 times 100 times 120. So we've got cos x is, again, bear with me, So 0 0.257 dot dot dot. And you know you're on the right lines if you've got a number between minus 1 and 1. So I make x, let's say, 75.1 degrees to three significant figures. All right, I'm going to keep the exact answer in my calculator because now we're going to substitute it into this formula at the top to work it out. So we're going to have to do half times. So it's got to be two sides and what's called the included angle, so the angle between the two sides. So that's going to be sine of our 75.1. So in my calculator, I'm going to do 0 0.5 times 100 times 120 times sine answer. And that gives me um, 5,798, let's say, metres squared to four significant figures. Right. Explain why it would not be reasonable to expect your answer in part one to be accurate to the nearest square metre. So we've put ours accurate to the nearest square metre. They're telling us that's probably not right. And if we think about a field, it's not going to have all of these exact measurements. So for all we know, um, these lengths aren't. We have assumed all these lengths are exactly straight. For all we know, this is 120 metres, but it goes like this. This is 135 metres, but it goes like that. So it probably wouldn't be sensible to think it would be that accurate. Let's see what they say. So um, for mark one, application of the cosine rule, notice here they've got, you could have done it with the other sides. Um, so three marks for getting an angle, one mark for summing in the area, and one mark for 5,800. And it says accept answers to greater degree of accuracy. Okay. Um, so two examples, the size might be to the near, accurate only to the nearest five metres, so that's something we didn't spot, well I didn't spot, was these are all to the nearest kind of five metres, so we wouldn't expect it to be that accurate. The sides are no more accurate than the nearest metre, so it could be half a metre out, taking half a metre of each side. Would, so actually I was completely wrong there, so we apparently were supposed to assume they were completely straight, um, but they're all talking about um, accuracy and measurements really. All right, question six. So the graph of y equals three sine squared theta for 0 to 360 degrees is shown in figure six. On the copy, on copy of figure six, sketch the graph of y equals two cos theta. Right, so we know cos theta looks like that, and it goes between one and minus one, and this will be 90, 180, 270, 360. So you, you need to just know that. 
So 2 cos theta is going to be the same, but it's going to be stretched. So it's going to hit 1 here. By 90, it's going to be at 0. Sorry, at 2, because it's stretched by 2. By 180, instead of being down at minus 1, it's going to be at minus 2. 270 will be at 0, and 360 will be back at 2. So let's see if I can do my best sketch of cos theta. There we go. Um, in this question, you must show detailed reasoning. In other words, you can't just put all this into your calculator. So determine the values of theta for which the two graphs cross. So we can see there's probably going to be two values, one between 0 and 90 and one between 270 and 360. But to do this, we're going to have to set 3 sine squared theta equal to 2 cos theta. OK, so to solve this, we're going to have to, because we've just got sines and cosses, we're going to have to use an identity to get it so it's either all in terms of sine or all in terms of cos. Now, we know sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1. So we know sine squared theta will be 1 minus cos squared theta. So we can take out the sine squared theta and sub in 1 minus cos squared theta. And what we're going to get at, when we expand all of this out, is actually a quadratic equation, but instead of x's, we've got cos's. So I'm going to throw everything over to the right-hand side. So we've got 0 equals 3 cos squared theta uh, plus 2 cos theta minus 3. So you can see we've got a quadratic equation. We can solve this in the same way we'd solve like 3x squared plus 2x minus 3. So if we try and factorise, so we might have to use the quadratic equation, because it is 6 marks, um, we're going to have 3 cos theta, and then cos theta, in the same way we'd have x and 3x. And then we've got to think, we're going to have to put in a 3, we need to end up with a plus 2. So I think we're going to have to have a... I think we might have to use a quadratic formula for this because it, I think it's not going to factorise. So let's see. Yep, so, so the way I did that, on the new A-level calculators there is a way of solving quadratic equations. So um, as we need to show detailed reasoning, I don't think in the exam we're going to be able to do that. But what we um, Obviously, it's a good it's a good way to check. Um, but what we can do now is just sub it straight into the formula. So we're going to have minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four a c all over two a. So we've got minus two plus or minus. So inside the square root, we're going to have four minus four times three times minus three which is 40, all over 6. OK. So let's see what that equals. If I put in... Now, the first one I'm going to check is a minus, because actually, if we get a number below minus 1 or above 1, we can't solve it. So first of all, if I make that a minus, I get cos theta equals minus 1.387. So that's not going to give us any solutions. Sorry, this is a bit messy. If I change it to minus 2 plus root 40, I get cos theta, try not to show off the mark scheme, cos theta equals 0 0.721, uh, let's say. And at that point, we can start finding results. So if I clear myself a bit of space, um, if we do inverse cos of the answer, the first result I get is... Zero, sorry, 43.9 degrees to three significant figures. Looking at our graph, that looks about right. And then I'm going to have to do 360 minus that to find the other result. So that gives me 316 points, uh, let's say one degree. So they're both to one decimal place. Okay, so if we look at the mark scheme, we've got uh, two marks for our sketch, one for the correct shape and symmetry, one for the correct up and down. So if you've got the sign of cos correct, you get one mark. If you've got this stretched, you get another. Um, then we get uh, a mark for equating them, a mark for using the identity, 
a mark for rearranging into a quadratic, and then a mark for solving the quadratic. And in fact, they just want the solution. So there's no marking for the working of the quadratic formula. You could have just written down the answers by just using that as a function on your calculator. And then uh, we get those two results. And you do need to specify that one where we got minus 1.387. So in the exam, I would, I would write that number down and then write no solutions. Okay, so question seven. An apple farmer has 200 trees, sorry, 200 apple trees. She invest, is investigating the masses of the crops of apples from individual trees. She decides to select a sample of these trees and find the mass of the crop for each tree. Explain how she can select a random sample of 10 different trees from 200 trees. So here they're looking for you to basically look at how can she select a kind of fair sample of all those trees. And hopefully you're not just going to say, you know, just pick the first 10 trees she comes across. You might say something kind of a systematic way of counting as in she could count that every 20th tree, so that would give her 10 trees out of the 200. Um, let's quickly look at the mark scheme for that, just see the kind of things they want. So they, yeah, they've got allocated numbers 0, 0, 001 to 200 to the trees and choose 10 uh, random numbers. So there they're doing it completely randomly, um, not just systematically as I said. Um, so it looks like they do want you to use this kind of randomly generated thing. So I suppose any time in the new A-levels when they ask you about coming up with a random sample, you're going to want to do this thing where you're allocating numbers and then choosing 10 random numbers from there. Okay. Anyway, so she finds the masses of crops from these 10 trees, measured in kilograms, recorded below. For these data, find the mean and the sample standard deviations. Now, in the old days of the A-level, you'd be expected to do this, like do all the calculations by hand. Nowadays, it's just two marks because this is something you can look up in your calculator. So hopefully you've got, the. I think the model they recommend is the Casio, it's FX991EX. So that's FX991EX, class whiz. So if, on there, if you press mode and then... One of the functions is statistics, which if you press 6, will take you straight there. So you want to press mode, statistics, then you want to press 1 for one variable. And then you'll get essentially a kind of uh, table where you can put in all these x values. So you can put in 23.5, 27.4, etc. all the way down. Um, okay, so I'm not going to do all that, but I'll talk you through how to get to those answers from there. So from that point, once you've put all the data in, press AC and it should just say statistics one variable on your screen. If you now press option, uh, you should see option two is one variable calc. So option and then press two for one variable calc. And then at the top you've got X bar which is your mean and if you scroll down you've got sigma X which is your um, standard deviation. Okay, so hopefully from that you should have what they've got here is 27.61 kilograms for the mean and 4.04 kilograms for the standard deviation. So I'm just going to cheat and write those down for now. Okay. <clears throat> So it says, show that there's one outlier at the upper end of the data. How far should the farm decide whether to use this outlier in further analysis of the data? So, uh, right. So let's um, think about how are we going to find the limits for outliers, given that we've got the mean and the standard deviation. Now, any outliers should be more than two standard deviations away from the mean. So if we want to show there is an outlier at the upper end of the data, we're going to have to do the mean plus two standard deviations. So that would be 27.61 plus two times 4.04, which is, by the way, to get out of stats mode, press, press menu and then one, and that will get you out of it. So if we do that, we get 35.69. So we can see this 38.1 is higher than 35.69, so it must be an outlier. Um, and then how should the farm decide whether to use this outlier in any further analysis of the data? Well, really, the only reason we wouldn't use that is if it was an untrue piece of data. So I reckon 
the farmers should try and investigate, um, either try and look at that sample, see whether it was correct or not, see if maybe they've just made a mistake in calculating it, or maybe do another 10 and see if it's correct. But let's see what the exam board want in all their wisdom. So this value should be investigated to check if it is genuine. If so, it should not be removed from the data, because why would you if there's nothing wrong with it? Okay. Uh, right. Oh, and another thing, if the value is not representative of the other 199 trees, because, for example, this tree is a different type, it should be ignored. So there probably is a bit of room for other answers there as well. Right, in an experiment, so question 8, the temperature of a hot liquid is measured every minute. The difference between the temperature of the hot liquid and room temperature um, is d degrees centigrade at time t minutes. Okay, and there's a graph of the data. It is thought that the model d equals 70 e to the power of minus 0.03 t might fit the data. Write down the derivative of e to the minus 0.03 t. Now you need to know that if you've got e to the power of something times x, the derivative is k e to the k x. Now e is just a fancy number that you're going to learn more about next year. It's essentially a number that follows this rule. So when you differentiate it, you get this derivative. So in our case, t is taking the place of x. So this is going to become um, minus 0.03e to the minus 0.03t. So that'll be its derivative. OK, it says explain how you know that 70e to the minus 0.03t is a decreasing function of t. So remember, if it's a decreasing function, that must mean that its derivative is... Um, always negative. So um, we know that, so in this it's going to be a bit weird because instead of having dy by dx, uh, capital D takes the place of y and t takes the place of x. So we're going to want to show that um, dd by dt is less than zero. So first off, let's work out what dd by dt is, and it's going to be. So it's going to be 70 times by that derivative we've already worked out, which is 70 times minus 0.03. So that's minus 2.1e to the minus 0.03t. Now we know e to the power of anything is always going to be positive. So what we can say is this is always going to be greater than 0. And we're then timesing that by a negative number. So as that's times by a negative number, that's always going to be negative. So let's see what they wanted on the mark scheme. So, yeah, so that is positive for all values of t, so the gradient is negative. So they didn't want too much explanation there. Right, calculate 70e to the minus 0.03t, where t equals 0, t equals 20. So in this case, all we're having to do is substitute in 0 and 20. So for a... We're going to have 70 times e to the minus 0 0.03 times 0. So this is going to be e to the 0, which is just 1. So it's going to be 70 times 1, which is 70. For part b, I think we're going to have to put it in our calculator. Um, so we're going to be subbing in 20 and give it to a nice degree of accuracy. So the e on your calculator, if you press alpha and then times 10 to the power at the bottom in the middle, you'll get an e, and then you can do the power of minus 0 0.0.3 times 20, and I get 38.423 significant figures. Okay, using your answers to part 2 and 3, discuss how well the model fits the data. Well, what we've essentially done is subbed in two x values and got two y values. So when t equals 0, we got 70. Well, that seems to fit the data very well because it's exactly on the point. When t equals 20, we got like 38.4. So it looks like um, it's correct for low values of t, but as values of t gets higher, it looks as if it's straying away from the values they've collected. Let's see what they want. Um, so they've got these. Um, so it says data values decreasing, so decrease function is suitable. Okay, fair enough. Um, ah, right, so it did say, I didn't read the question properly, using your answers to part 2 and 3. So we showed it was a decreasing function. We can see from the graph it's decreasing because it's always going down. 
So that one one reference to part two, where you're saying data value is decreasing, so it is a decreasing function. T equals zero matches the data. T equals 20, data value is 40, which is not exact, but close. So fair enough. Right, question nine. The box and whisker diagrams in figure 9.1 summarize the birth rates per thousand people for all the countries in the three of the regions as given in the pre-release data set. So this is that large data set, which hopefully your teachers have made you aware of. Um, they were drawn as part of an investigation comparing birth rates in different regions. So we've got um, Sub-Saharan Africa, East and Southeast Asia, and the Caribbean. Discuss the distribution of birth rates in these regions of the world. Make three different statements. You should refer to both the information from the box and whisker diagram and your knowledge of the large data set. So, if we have a look what's going on. So we've got three different statements. I'll probably make a statement about... Um, each one, if I were you. So if we look at um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and I'd say the most striking thing about this is, for one thing, it's got the highest range of all three. So it's got the biggest range of birth rates in all those different um, countries. And also it's got the highest birth rate. So its median is the highest. Um, if we look at East and Southeast Asia, it's got a median which is in the middle, and it's slightly less spread out than Africa. But the, I think it's got the largest interquartile range, just children have either, approximately the same as Africa. And then the Caribbean has actually got the lowest birth rate um, and it's least spread out. So let's see the kinds of things they're expecting you um, to put as part of your answer. So there's great spread of birth rates countries in Sub-Saharan Africa than countries in the Caribbean. The range of countries in Africa is greater than countries in East and Southeast Asia, but this could be caused by outliers. So he talks about the interquartile range has been about the same. Sub-Saharan Africa is a mixture of economically rich and poor countries resulting in a larger interquartile range. So there, that's really where you're starting to use what you know about the large data set, and maybe you might just know it from um, common knowledge about the world. Uh, countries in East and Southeast Asia tend to have higher life expectancy than countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, so their population are older. Again there, you're looking, you're using your knowledge of the large data set. Okay, so one mark for a correct relevant comment that can be inferred from the source material. That means you're getting it from the graphs they've given you. Um, another one for that. And the third one um, needs a reference to um, the large data set. So in fact, you can get two marks without referring to the large data set at all, but you need to add in some little pearl of wisdom you know about those countries to access that third mark. Okay, part two. Um, the birth rates for all countries in Australasia are shown below. So we've got Australia, New Zealand and Papua New Guinea. Explain why the calculation is not correct enough to find the birth rate per thousand for Australasia as a whole. So it looks like what they've done is they've seen the birth rates for these three and then they've added them up and divided by three. So they found the mean of these three numbers. Now, I would imagine Australia has got a much higher population than Papua New Guinea. So actually this 12.19 is probably going to be kind of amplified more, if you like, in that calculation. So they've treated it the same as this 24.89 for Papua New Guinea. So although Papua New Guinea has a high birth rate, um, there's probably less people in Papua New Guinea, so that wouldn't be representative of Australasia as a whole. So it says, without doing any calculation, explain whether the birth rate per thousand for Australasia as a whole is higher or lower than 16.83. So I would probably go and say that it would be lower because um, the kind of 12, the lower numbers, Australia and New Zealand, are kind of underrepresented in that calculation. So let's see the kind of things again that I've wanted you to put. So the calculation doesn't use population as weights, kind of what we talked about, um, or does not take populations into account. Um, and then lower because Australia is the highest population but the lowest birth rate, um, or something equivalent, so uh, you're giving too much weight to Papua New Guinea. All right, part three. So the scatter diagram shown in figure 9.2 shows birth rates per thousand and physicians or doctors per thousand population for all countries in our pre-release large data set. Describe the correlation in the diagram. Now this is one mark, so they're probably not going to want a lot, I would probably say something like, it looks kind of negative and it's quite weak. So maybe weak, negative correlation. All they're really looking for here is 
strong or weak, positive or negative, or maybe even no correlation. Discuss briefly whether the scattergram shows that high birth rates would be reduced by increasing the number of physicians in the country. So it's basically they're saying, well, as the number of physicians goes up, the birth rate goes down. So in other words, if we say, take one of these countries which has a high birth rate, one of these ones up here, if we introduce a load more doctors to the situation, will that bring the birth rate down? Now my gut would say that, um, so you may have heard the phrase that correlation doesn't imply causation. In other words, just because there's more physicians, that doesn't cause there to be a birth rate. It might be there's some other thing underpinning it, which I would think if you look at it broadly, the richer a country is, actually probably the more doctors it has for a start because they have more money to spend on medicine and health, but also they tend the rich countries in the world tend to have a lower birth rate. So it could be that's an underpinning factor. You couldn't just airdrop in a load of doctors um, into a country of a high birth rate and expect the birth rate to go down. So for the first part, they just want a negative correlation. Um, so yeah, some statement like correlation or association does not imply causality. That's saying the number of doctors doesn't imply the lower birth rate. Um, some countries with low birth rates have low physician density. Some countries with low, so less doctors, have quite low birth rates. Data does not show what happens after an increase in physicians. So all it's showing us is what's going on at the moment, not when there is an increase. So not possible to be certain. So essentially they want you to say not possible to be certain and give one sensible reasons like the ones above. Okay, question 10. A company operates trains. The trains. The company claims that 92% of its trains arrive on time. We should assume that in a random sample they arrive independently of each other. So that's saying just because one train's late doesn't mean the next train's going to be late, which, as we know in real life, probably isn't the case. So it says, assuming that 92% of the company's trains arrive on time, find the probability in a random sample of 30 trains operated by this company, exactly 28 arrive on time. Now what you have to realise here is this is a binomial distribution because we've got 30 trials which each have a 0.92 chance of a success and what we're looking for is a probability that we have 28 successes, so 28 of them arrive on time. Now again this is something you need to use your new calculator for, so press menu and this time we're going to click on 7 for distribution and what we want to look at, because we're looking at the um, where x equals is the binomial PD, that stands for binomial probability distribution. So press 4 and then press 2 for variable and then we're going to put in the value we want, in this case 28 for x, for n that's the number of trials, we're going to have 30 and for p the probability of a success in our case is 0 0.92. So when you go through all that you should get an answer of 0 0.2696 and let's give that to four decimal places, which is quite a good rule of thumb for um, for probability questions. Right, then they want the probability that more than 27 trains arrive on time. Now, your calculator can do kind of um, inequalities, but it has to be in the form less than or equal to. So we, if, if this was uh, there was less than or equal to 27 trains arrive on time, we could go to the binom binomial CD, the cumulative distribution, and that would tell us. But what we're going to have to do here is change it into one of those. So actually, if you think, if you if we have 27 trains or more, that means that 28, 29, or 30 trains are arriving on time. That's going to be 1 minus the probability of an X is less than or equal to 27. So that x is less than or equal to 27, we can find from our calculator. So again, you're going to, have to go into distributions, this time click down and go to binomial CD, and then we're going to have x is 27, n is 30, and p is still 0 0.92, so we're going to have to do 1 minus 0 0.4346, which is 0 0.5654. Um, okay. <clears throat> So, last part, a journalist believes that the percentage of trains operated by this company which arrive on time is lower than 92%. To investigate the journalist's beliefs, a hypothesis test will be carried out at the 1% significance level. A random sample of 18 trains is selected. For this hypothesis test, state the hypotheses and find the critical region. So, first thing, our hypotheses, we're going to have a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. 
So this is going to be to do with our value of p. Now we've assumed that p equals 0 0.92. So, whoops, um, this is always your null hypothesis is always your status quo, what you're starting from. But this journalist believes p has decreased and now it's lower than 0 0.92. So this is always going to be p equals something, and this is always going to be either p is less than, p is greater than, or p is not equal to. And we need to define what p is, which in this case is the probability of a train um, of a train arriving on time under no, what am I talking about? Just the probability of a train operated by this company arriving on time. So to investigate the journalist's belief, um, they're going to sample 18 trains. So we know under this under the old system, we would assume that I've, we're going to have 18 trains and they've got a 0 0.92 chance of a success. Now generally with the hypothesis test, what they'll do is they'll say something like, four trains arrived on time. And then what you would do is say something like, well, let's find the property x is less than or equal to four, which we can do using our binomial CD. So I'm going to set x equal to four this time. N is now changed to 18 and P is still 0 0.92. And I get a very, very, very small number. So I picked four was probably quite a stupid number to use there because I get zero point and then loads and loads and loads and loads of zeros, 986 or something. And if this was a normal hypothesis test, we would then conclude this is less than 1%, therefore we would reject H0. So what we need to look for here is what number do we put in that place of, in the place of 4 where we're crushing, crossing the threshold from above 1% to below 1%. So I would try out lots of different numbers on your calculator until you get one that looks right. Um, so let's try 12. 12 is still a very small number. 13... Right, so if I sub in 13, I get 0 0.0116. Now this number is greater than 1%. So if we did this sample and 13 trains arrived on time, we would still accept H0. Now if I change that to 12, the number actually drops below 1%. So we actually end up with 0 0.0021. So this is now less than 1%, which means our critical region um, is anything 12 or lower. So we can say the critical region equals, so you can use a bit of set notation and say uh, 0, 1, dot, 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 all the way up to 12. Um, yeah, so that would be our critical region. So in that test, if any less than, in 12 or less trains um, were arrived on time, then we would say the journalist has got a point and actually we should reject H0, maybe. Okay, so um, two marks for the first two bits. So one for the kind of uh, setting it up as a binomial question and then for the answer, and then for doing this and then getting the answer. You could have done this one directly also by finding the probability of 28, 29 and 30 trains. Okay, um, now for the hypothesis test, you get a mark for defining P, so the probability a train arrives on time, um, a mark for H0 and H1, and then you get a mark for any probability that X is less than or equal to any whole number from 1 to 18. So actually, if you just put in any number, you'll get one of those marks. And then you get the second mark if you look at both 13 and 12. So you need to write down both of those two numbers at which point you can define the critical region. Okay. Okay, question 11. So, figure 11 shows the curve y x f of x, where f of x is a cubic function. The coordinates of the turning points and the point of intersection with the axes are shown in figure 11. Okay, show that the tangent to f of x at x equals t is parallel to the tangent to y x f of x at x equals minus t for all values of t, and it's six marks. So I think the first thing we're going to have to do is try to find the um, equation of this cubic and then we can start worrying about uh, tangents and things like that. So the first thing I'll tell you to look at, if we first of all think about what a cubic looks like, we can either think of it as ax cubed plus bx squared plus cx plus d. But I think what's going to be more useful to us in this case is knowing that if we factorise it all, we know it's going to have three brackets because it's cubic, and it might be times by something, so they might all be times by two or seven or whatever. 
Um, now, how do we find these brackets? Well, they correspond to these roots here. So these brackets correspond to where we have roots. The reason is um, because where a bracket equals zero, um, that would make the whole equation equal zero. So we know that two zero must have come from there being a bracket of x minus two. And similarly, here we would have a bracket of x, of x plus one. So we can make another one of these x plus one. But in fact, we notice this is also a turning point. Now these are sometimes called repeated roots. So because it actually doesn't cross here, it just touches the axis, that must mean there are two roots there. So this must be x plus one squared, if you like. So there's two x plus ones. Now we're not completely finished because we still haven't found this value for a. So we're going to have to use one of these other points to help us. So I think if we use the fact that when x equals 0, y equals minus 3, we should be able to find a. So um, what I'm going to do is substitute in minus 3 for y, and then we're going to make <clears throat> um, a, sorry, x equals 0. So we'll have 0 minus 2 is minus 2, 0 plus 1 is 1, and 0 plus 1 is 1. So we've got minus 3 equals minus 2a. So if we divide by 2, we get a is 1.5. So we know the equation of this cubic is y equals 1.5, x minus 2, x plus 1, squared. Because there's two x plus 1s. So now answer the question. If we're trying to find show that these tangents are parallel, we're going to have to start finding the gradient of this function. So to do that, we're going to have to differentiate it. And to do that, we're going to need to expand it out into powers of x. So I'm going to start expanding out this function. So I'm going to start off doing the x plus 1 times by x plus 1. So we'd have x squared plus 2x plus 1. Then if we expand out uh, the last bit, we'll have x times x squared is x cubed. x times 2x is 2x squared. x times 1 is x. Minus 2 times x squared is minus 2x squared. Done something wrong here, that should be an x squared. Apologies. Yep. And then we'll have minus 4x minus 2. So if we tidy that up to start, we've got x cubed. The x squareds cancel. We've got minus 3x minus 2, which we've expanded it all out. We've got 1.5x squared minus 4.5x minus 6 and I'm just uh, sorry that should be cubed and that should be cubed sorry long day I uh, just want to check this is all correct so far yeah good and there was something a bit wrong that should, shouldn't be a 3 what have I done wrong there hmm Ah, right, sorry, 1.5 times minus 2 isn't minus 6, it's minus 3. Right, so very easy to make lots of stupid mistakes here. So now if we differentiate it, so we're differentiating because we want to talk about the gradient of the tangent, we'll have 4.5x squared minus 4.5. Now what we want to show is that this is parallel when x equals t and when x equals minus t. In other words, they should equal each other whether we sub in t or minus t. So let's make x equal t. So instead of having 4.5x squared minus 4.5, we're going to have 4.5t squared minus 4.5. Now if we sub in minus t, we'll have 4.5 times minus t squared minus 4.5. Now minus t times minus t is just t squared. So this is 4.5t squared minus 4.5. And you can see we've got the same thing. So I'd put a sentence in your exam to explain, you know, as we've got the same answer, um, they must be equal, the gradients would be equal, whether we sub in plus a number or minus a number. So you get a mark for kind of putting it in this form, a mark for subbing in one of the numbers, and then a, another mark for arriving here. So you only get three marks for finding um, the equation of the graph. And you get another mark for expanding it all out, another mark for finding the gradient, 
and then another mark for showing some way it will be equal whether you sub in t or minus t. Okay. And it says not just the gradient is the same for minus t, so you need a bit more than that, something like we did there where we actually substituted in the numbers. Okay. Right, question 12. So it says given that arc sine x equals arc cos x, prove that x squared plus y squared equals 1. Right, and it says hint, let arc sine x equal theta. Okay, now when they give you a hint, especially in the last question of an exam, I would usually take it. So um, let's make arc sine x equal theta then and see what happens. So we'll have theta equals arc cos of, whoops, missed off a C, arc cos of y. So if we cos both sides, we'll have cos theta equals y. Okay, now looking at this, I hope that you're thinking about um, y squared plus, sorry, um, what's it called? Sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. Because what I think we can do now is say, we know that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta equals 1, so that's a given. So if we sub y in for... Um, if we sub y in for cos theta, we're going to have sine squared theta plus y squared equals 1. Now we also know that arc sine x equals theta, so that must mean that x equals sine theta. So again, we can sub that into here and we've got x squared plus y squared equals 1. So what that question takes is essentially you knowing what arc cos and arc sine mean, and it's really essential that you have to use this identity to prove it. So we can make x equals sine theta, uh, y equals cos theta, and then we get that x squared plus y squared equals 1. So there you get one mark for x is sine theta, Another mark for getting y is cos theta, and another mark for subbing it in and getting to the answer. I think that's one, if you don't know how to do it, is very difficult. I know that sounds obvious, but I think that's quite a difficult question.